Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by Farm Credit. I want to start you off with a look at these uh, first three weeks of the month of October. Our map, first of all, here shows the total precipitation ranks by climate district. And what we're really trying to identify are any areas that have kind of slipped into drought as we've worked our way now into a bit of fall. We're actually one full month into fall which means we've got two more months of losing daylight before we start to gain again. So our first map, again, kind of shows better rains that happened mainly from a tropical system that came out of the Bay of Campeche that hit parts of, well, southern Alabama, hitting Georgia and South Carolina. But other than that, rainfall's been kind of hard to come by for much of North Carolina getting to Virginia, and then it's been really dry back here in parts of the Tennessee and lower Mississippi River Valley. Now, just getting you a bigger picture of what's going on across the country, I want to show you the latest drought monitor. This one came out last Thursday, and it shows us about 60% of the land area in the lower 48 in some form of drought. And uh, if we kind of take a look at where drought, drought is the deepest, excuse me, it's going to be parts of the Central Plains, this whole section of the Cotton Belt here, then the deepest and largest area of drought being in parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. We've watched drought continue to creep into this particular area, though. It's been wetter closer to the coast, but into the interior we've been drier. Now, when I hover over this, you're going to notice it highlights a region, which goes all the way from Virginia all the way down into parts of Mississippi and Alabama, right there, really into Alabama. That region is called the, the Southeast region by the National Weather Service. And what I want to show you is a history of drought in that area. So using the Southeast, which again, is just this area that I highlighted right here. Okay, see this? This is what things look like in terms of the percent of land area covered in drought since the year 2000. That's when the modern drought monitor began. And we sit right here, okay? So when we just kind of look at the total area, let's kind of get the latest data, it's right uh, there, sorry. We have 56% of the Southeast states, which again, are this, those states identify with the National Weather Service in some form of drought, or about 30% in D0 to D4 drought, okay? Now, when I show you this, it's really just to look and look at historic, you know, really bad drought time period, like 2016 into early 17, this whole time period of 11, 12, and 13, the same thing for basically 07, 08, and part of 09, and then back here in the very early 2000s, like 2000 to 2003. So comparatively, you know, even though there are dry spots, we look historically, we see much, much greater drought extent in this historic time period. When we want to look at where drought is, I think, the deepest, let's go to the soil moisture maps and look throughout the Mississippi Basin. So big section of the Missouri Basin, the Ohio Basin, the upper Mississippi, including the Great Lakes, and then the lower basin is still very low. And this has been an ongoing story. Of course, we surpassed the record set last year. The river has come up just slightly as of late in the evening here on uh, October 22nd. It was at minus 10.2 feet. It did bottom out at 12 feet below low stage, setting a record. So this is going to continue to be an ongoing concern about uh, the lower Mississippi basin and the water uh, throughout the southeast. Now, we know that the longer range forecasts, and I'll review those again at the end here, are for favorable wet winter conditions. But right now, we're going to be tucked away into a bit of a pattern shift that is overall drier. And I want to talk to you about that. Because what we're going to be shifting away from is this. Much of the first three weeks of October have had some pretty chilly air in the southeast. We are on the colder half of the distribution of years here, while much of the west has been very, very warm. And way up here in parts of Maine have been very warm as well. So what's going to be changing? Let's go have a look at it here. This next map shows you the first three weeks of October in what the trough ridge pattern has been up to. We've had a very large ridge of high pressure that has sat right in through this area. And there's been a trough in the Gulf of Alaska. It's run over this ridge here and come over the top and kind of dove into a deep trough that's been occupying much of the east. This has been complemented by this deeper trough that's over Scandinavia right in through here. Now, if you want to see what the jet stream has been doing during that time, it's done something like this. It's extended, but it stayed pretty far to the north in the Pacific. It then dove into the southeastern part of the United States and then accelerated all the way out. Now, what we're watching for here is any sense of a change in this pattern. And last week, we began to allude to it. Let's go have a quick discussion, a quick update on that. So this is what's been building. These first two and a half to three weeks of the month, we've watched a broad area of subsidence in the atmosphere develop right here. That's where air is sinking overall. Because it's descending in this region, it's rising here, and it's starting to rise here over Africa. Now, why is this important? Well, we're at that time of year where the factors that influence the North Atlantic, like the North Atlantic Oscillation, or the Arctic Oscillation, 
or the Bering Sea pressure systems, or what goes on in the Chukchi Sea, or the whole of the Arctic, or Siberian snow cover, all of these winter type things, especially the winter, uh, the polar vortex, excuse me, they are yet to really grip and control the pattern. So what we're keeping an eye on is the tropics. And there is a tropical system that's out here right now, Tammy, but Tammy is not going to influence us. Our tropical influence is coming from half a world away. It's controlling the position of the MJO, and this is what it looks like. Over the next 15 days, starting now, going through the first six days of November, this right here is what I need to be paying attention to. Because where that subsidence currently is, it's not expected to move. And what this has been doing is this has been working on the pattern to get it into what we're about to see now in the third week of the month. And we're watching for more rising motion over Africa. Now that rising motion over Africa is called MJO phase one. And what I want you to see is that over the next, you know, 10 days or so, there's going to be a lot of subsidence here and rising motion there and some here as well. Now we know something about this. We know the history of MJO phase one. And if you're in the month of October getting into November, it just tends to favor deeper troughs developing west. Now they haven't been here, right? They've, they've been over the southeast. But we're now getting this sense of ridging developing along the east coast. And even though this is what just typically happens whenever there's an El Nino and MJO phase one, what it suggests is that the pattern is going to go more to something like this. Whereas for weeks, it's been doing the opposite. So we're about to see a pattern flip. And that pattern flip is being kind of shown to us pretty clearly by now seeing this thing called the Pacific North American Oscillation go negative. Now just remember this. Whenever the PNA is down here below the zero line, there are troughs in the west. And if there are troughs in the west of the United States, there are ridges for us. So for weeks, the PNA has been way up here. It's been positive. And now it has dropped. And we see that even though it's expected to return to normal, this doesn't open up another deep, deep, deep sustained trough of cold air in the east. So the pattern is about to change in a pretty significant way for us. Now we know something about the Pacific North American pattern. And what I did was I looked at October to December and I attempted to correlate precipitation with it. Now what this tends to give us when the PNA goes into this negative phase is we tend to get a bit of a drier signal here and a drier signal in the southeast. But I want you to know that the PNA is not the only thing that influences the pattern. It's influencing the pattern now and that's why I'm going to show you a much drier forecast for us for at least the next 10 days while the PNA bottoms out. But it's not going to get stuck there. Okay, so don't don't think that this dryness I'm about to explain is going to be the rest of your fall. And some other reasoning for that all has to do with what the other parts of the jet stream are up to. You see, the jet stream right now across the Pacific has made a move farther to the south. This phase shift diagram shows us that its net position right now is more equatorward, but it's trying to extend. And if it extends, that means that the pattern is going to resist kind of longer term blocking features. So I need to explain to you what I mean by all of this and what the end result is going to be. First of all, I do want to show you that over the weekend, we did have some light rain that got in here around this deeper upper level low that exited earlier in the weekend. And you can see it in parts of the Carolinas here. As we go forward in this forecast, though, this larger ridge of high pressure that's going to build in is going to keep us relatively dry. And this is what it looks like by the time we get into Tuesday. The jet stream pulls into this omega pattern over Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. And these deep troughs in the west are going to come together to make a pretty sizable series of systems that come out of the mountains and make their way in this direction across the country. The southeast is largely going to be sitting under a ridge for much of this week. So through Tuesday, getting into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I mean, this I just blew through a week right there, and you saw no change at all in the pattern over the southeast. In fact, the Omega block still sits off the west coast. That's why systems roll through the country, and they don't penetrate into the southeast because of this large ridge that's there. So where's the wetter weather going to be through this week and even into early next week? Well, we may have to wait until almost Halloween before we can start to break down that ridge and bring in a trough of low pressure. So as it stands, right now the concern would be that we're going to open up the gulf to wetter weather here. There's also going to be some wetter weather in the middle there. But we're also going to keep a lot of cold air, not over us anymore, but instead back in the north or in the west. 
So this is just looking out there, like at the end of the month, what to expect. In other words, how long is what I'm about to share with you going to last? It may still be around there as we finish up the month of October and start the month of November. So we'll see some big changes in this map. This is our year-to-date snowfall map. Now, it's going to be a fun map to watch throughout the rest of the year, especially given how active I'm expecting the southeast and east coast once we get into winter. But right now, when I show you this map next week, the big changes are going to be in this part of the country. That's where we're expecting to have our snow. So what do we have right now? Well, we've got the cooler air that's still butting up against the Appalachian Mountains. And that cooler air, though, has kind of an expiration date. Because what you see happening here, these are winter weather, uh, excuse me, winter storm watches. And this is where the new source of colder air is going to be coming from. So when I tell you there's some snow coming in this, take a look. This is the next seven days forecast for snowfall. We're expecting snow to come out of Wyoming, out of the Cascades, through uh, parts of Idaho, and into Montana and the Canadian Prairie. We also see this in the GFS. So both the European and the GFS are starting to line up with this system. And it's expected to put down some pretty big snow here throughout the north and throughout uh, parts of Montana, getting into the Canadian Prairie. But for us, our next 10 days, high pressure settles in, flow runs around the periphery of it, systems run up like this. And that high pressure cell blocks us away from getting significant rainfall in, having fronts pass through. And that's why we are on the drier side of the distribution going forward. Interestingly enough, right now we have Hurricane Norma on Sunday night hitting here. Norma's moisture is expected to spread all along the edge of this big high pressure cell while each new system rolls in behind it. So it's going to be a very active pattern, just not for Ag South Territory. Let me show you what we're expecting here. I've got over on the left the GFS. That's the U.S. flagship model. Over on the right, I have the European. Now you're going to see some very similar features early this week through Monday and into Tuesday. And what it is, is high pressure building here in the south and southeast and up the east coast. And all around its edge, heavy rain coming in. It's in both models. Now by the time we get to Tuesday night into Wednesday morning, we see that these large systems start to form coming off the mountains. The models have a little bit different timing, a little bit different solution on them. But they're definitely coming through the central United States, leaving snow on their backside. Could we possibly on Thursday get a scattered shower into uh, you know, um, uh, Georgia? <laughs> Maybe, you know, but I think overall this is a drier week for us. Even into Friday and Saturday, all of it just continues to roll around high pressure we're going to be experiencing all week. So when that high pressure is in place, it just acts as a barrier keeping things away. But this pattern, as I explained to you earlier, isn't fully blocked and stuck and unmoving. All of that activity in the Indian Ocean keeps the Pacific jet, well, with a bit more of a push to it. So we do get into next week and start to see this breaking down and moisture returning to our area. But you've got a good 8 to 10 days where we're going to see, well, not much in way of precipitation. So I brought up a map that shows you all the way to November the 1st. And what it looks at here is the probability of getting less than half of an inch of rain. So the net effect of this high pressure that's going to dominate for the next week, week and a half, is that overall our chances are quite limited in getting precipitation. In fact, I've even went a step lower than this. This is the chance of getting less than a tenth of an inch. And you see 50 to 70% chances across most of Ag South Territory. Now the net effect of all of this is that we're in drought and there's some warmer temperatures. Excuse me, we're in fall and there's warmer temperatures, which means drought's going to build. We're going to see some drought resulting uh, from this pattern. But the jet stream, as I said, still is open and going. And by the time we get out there into the month of November, we start to see the jet stream really begin to pick up its momentum leaving the United States. And it's a little bit different situation watching the Pacific branch dive and enter the U.S. and get picked up with a bit of a subtropical flavor to it. What's that all mean? Well, that means when you look out there at the week two forecast, it is not as dry as advertised in some of the current forecasts. While we're going to be seeing week one, this is the uh, WPC, the European model, and the GFS. They've got nothing for us. Week two starts to show hints of more activity. So that's what we're looking at in the next two weeks in terms of precip. The temperature side of things, this is where we're expecting a frost in the next seven days. So we've got some chilly air to start this week. And you can see here at higher elevation where we're expecting to see that risk of frost. 
But our daytime high temperatures, well, this is what they were on Sunday. By Monday, still cool along the east, but look at the heat building in the central United States. As the ridge opens on Tuesday into Wednesday, our temperatures start to rebound, and by Thursday, we're back up in the mid-70s, touching 80 in parts of southern Georgia. We see that going into Friday. Saturday, still warm, while all of this Arctic air starts to funnel into the central part of the country here, behind the deep low that's producing all of that snow. What do our temperatures do beyond that? Well, there's your next five days. As we play out our day five to ten, that's the effect of the ridge, back warmer than normal. And then as we work our way later into the month of November, like the first full week, the pattern, like I said, progresses. I think we get a cooler shot of air and our chances for precipitation come back up. Now, as you know, the next 10 days are not favorable for overall for rainfall. But what we want to ask ourselves is, is the pattern shut down for it? The newest European model run, which was just released on Sunday, suggests that the month of November, which is what's shown here, is going to be quite active for the whole of the United States. In fact, across Ag South Territory, we don't see drier conditions. We see wetter conditions from Texas all the way through the Mississippi Valley. And look at the West. Now, this is not typical of uh, El Nino, which means El Nino is not dominating this pattern. If you say, well, what's typical? This is what I would tell you to expect in November. Based on El Nino, we should be soaking wet in this area. But we've got other factors at play, meaning that we're looking at more normal November precipitation outlooks right now. Now, should something in the North Atlantic shift? Should the Pacific North American pattern behave differently? Should the MJO move? Should El Nino really crank up the subtropical jet? I will let you know about those changes. Those are definitely possible. But our longer term expansive drought risk is still on the very low side, primarily because we have an El Nino. Our government just released their latest long range forecast. They're also looking in November for better chances of rainfall. So finish October dry start November a little bit dry, but there are indications of better moisture returning. What's interesting is I don't necessarily agree on what the temperature pattern is going to be. I think if we stay where the MJO currently is, we drop more troughs into the west than indicated, which would mean you might see more mild days at times throughout this particular month of November, given the current setup in the jet stream. I've got low confidence in that. I'll just be honest with you. I have very low confidence in that right now because I'm waiting to see how these other subseasonal factors, mainly the ones that influence the North Atlantic and the North Pacific and the Arctic, to begin to take over November. If you thought October was a transition month, November for the Southeast is a big time transition month. And if we continue to see deeper troughs diving into the West, not only is this a wetter signal, but it's also a risk for kind of our fall, you know, severe weather season. So I need to be just on my toes watching that so that I know what could potentially come because this El Nino is still there and it at some point will start to engage in this pattern. And right in there with those warmer waters, it should start to crank this subtropical jet, meet up with the Pacific jet, and really start to increase activity across the east. You combine that with the warm water in the Atlantic, and we've got, we've got a mixture that's there that says don't sit on a sleepy pattern. I think it's going to get cranked once we get farther and farther uh, into uh, our winter time frame. Now, since we're looking internationally, I want to bring up the speed on South America, specifically Brazil. Mato Grosso, their biggest producing state. Again, you could fit. I live in the state of Illinois. I just know this stat. You could fit uh, seven Illinois inside of Mato Grosso. They're their biggest soybean and corn producer. And right now, they're at 60% planted. Five-year average is about 50%. Last year, they were at 67. Ahead of the five-year, below last year's pace. And if we look out there at the forecast, we see continued better rains filtering in. Once we get past about the next three to four days, they're coming right back into the area that needs them while we continue to flood in southern Brazil. What was not well forecasted last week is that there is rain coming into Argentina this week, but it is far less than what was anticipated in last week's week two forecast, Okay, which would be this week's forecast. I want to show you one last thing. The latest long range update for November, December, January looks like this globally. Now, do you notice that there's drier conditions here and wetter there? The longer range models are still suggesting there's more suppression in the atmosphere here and rising motion there. And what we'll watch for that to do in November and in December is to help feed the subtropical jet. 
which is why right now our longer range forecasts for North America during this time period continue to show wetter conditions for Axe South Territory. So long story short, pattern just flipped. We're going to warm up, but we're going to go drier. We've had some drought expanding in our area lately. It's not going to get any better for the next 10 days. So long stretches of drier weather are coming. But we don't think that's the way the pattern is going to get stuck permanently. I think we're going to open up the subtropical jet and get things rolling again. But that's coming later in the season. So I'm still not overly worried about the building of droughts like we have in these historic time periods here. So let's just see how this all evolves as we go forward. I'll keep you up to date and we'll talk again next week. I appreciate your time. Thanks.